Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, this, this is my talk about progressive decoupling um, using Vue alongside Drupal. I've got quite a lot of code examples, and they're generally images, and the contrast isn't always great. So if you'd like to follow along on your own screens, um, bit.ly forward slash dc hyphen view hyphen prog will bring up the slides, and then there's like JS fiddle links, and you can adjust the contrast and stuff. So my name is Phil Wolstenholme. I'm a front-end developer at CTI Digital in Manchester in the United Kingdom. You can find me on drupal.org as phil hyphen Wolstenholme and on Twitter as philw underscore. We've got quite a lot to talk about. I was quite ambitious in what I put in my talk abstract, um, possibly overly ambitious. So if we run out of time, then come find me at lunch, um, talk to me on Twitter, happy to answer questions then. So we're going to be running through what progressive decoupling is compared to regular coupling, or decoupling rather. We're going to be talking about what Vue is in the context of front-end UI frameworks and libraries talking about why I feel Vue and Drupal are really good partners, then getting into a little bit of a case study, and then finally some tips if you want to take this back home and start playing around with Vue and Drupal. So we'll start with what progressive decoupling is. So decoupling in general is when we break the bond between Drupal as a back-end CMS system that provides data and Drupal as a sort of um, system that renders your front end. We can think about coupling and decoupling on a sort of scale or a continuum. Um, and this is what we have up here. So on the left-hand side, we have our traditional coupled Drupal site where um, Drupal gets the data, Drupal renders it, and knows exactly what's going to be on the page. And because it knows exactly what's going to be on the page, it can do nice things like in-place editing, contextual links, layout builder, live previews, all that kind of Drupal-y stuff that we, we know and love. A fully decoupled site is on the opposite side of the spectrum, so on the right-hand side, and that's where Drupal is purely sort of an API, a, a data repository, a, a content hub, um, and you use a framework or library like Vue or Angular or React to handle the front-end routing, um, content changes, UI stuff, all through client-side JavaScript code. Progressive decoupling exists in the middle, in a sort of a happy place, where we use Drupal to do all the bits that it's really good at, and then we add a layer of JavaScript on top to do sort of more dynamic application-like stuff that Drupal's not necessarily so good at. We'll come back to more benefits of that in a later slide. So with progressive decoupling, um, Drupal handles the routing, collecting data from the database or other sources, transforming it through things like text filters, making a render tree, allowing other modules, contrib, custom ones, themes, to transform that render tree, and then finally dumping it all on the page as HTML. So up to that point, it's a traditional Drupal site. The difference with progressive decoupling is that we then layer on top of that a bit of extra JavaScript. And this could target just a small part of the page. It could be like a block with um, a live weather widget in it, um, or it could be a larger part of the page, for example, like a um, a real-time blog for a sport event or a political event. So we can imagine that most of the page would be Drupal. The header and footer could be normal Drupal blocks. There could be a sidebar of normal Drupal blocks. The only thing that would be handled by the JavaScript would be the section in the middle where we need the dynamic content. Everything else is, is standard. This is a, a pretty crazy diagram from a Dries blog post in 2019. We don't need to look at it too closely, but I'll, I'll talk through um, what it describes, because it's a good way of covering the benefits. In this top red box, we've got two columns. On the left, we have editorial interests. So I want to be able to have a live preview. I want to be able to control page layout. I want to use in-place editing. And I want my HTML to be accessible. This is a big thing for me with decoupling. Um, a lot of effort in Drupal goes into accessibility. We have an accessibility gate. So we know for sure that things like our form API is always going to produce accessible markup. When we give control of things like forms to a decoupled site, there isn't that guarantee. So you have to make sure that your developers are sufficiently aware and skilled up and, and able to, to match Drupal's level of accessibility. If you have a coupled site or progressively decoupled where Drupal's handling the forms, you don't need to worry about that as much. On the right-hand side, we have sort of more developer needs. So these are things like, I need to be able to control the markup exactly. Um, I want to use JavaScript because I'm going to be pulling in lots of APIs. I want to do real-time stuff. It's going to be hard to do that in PHP. 
There's also sort of agency needs, like we find it hard to find good Drupal developers, but everyone wants to do React, so maybe we should just build more React sites because it might be easier. Progressive decoupling is when you have both of those problems. You have editorial needs, you have developer needs, and you need to find a compromise. And that's what the second box says. It says requirements reflect both editorial and developer needs. And the decision tree there leads down to a progressively decoupled website. So that's a quick introduction to progressive decoupling. Now let's talk about Vue. Um, this isn't going to be like a super technical talk. It's not going to introduce anything like crazy, not too much detail. I really just want to, want to raise awareness of using Vue because it's probably in the last five years been the thing that's made me most excited about my job. Um, it's changed how I feel about front-end development, especially with Drupal. Um, and I absolutely I love it. It's, it's, it's really amazing. Um, I don't want this to get into like a, a Vue versus Angular, Vue versus React talk, because it's not that kind of talk. But if you want that, there's like millions of Medium articles about that. But I am going to talk about what I think Vue's strengths are, especially in a Drupal context. So Vue, Vue.js, pronounced Vue. Um, it's an open source UI framework. And it's the sort of from the second generation of these things. So it's not like Ember or Knockout. It's more similar to React. Um, it's maintained by a core team, similar to Drupal in a way. The lead developer, Evan Yu, used to work at Google. Um, he used Angular day in, day out. And he thought, there's good bits about this. There's bad bits. What if I made my own version? Um, he doesn't actually work at Google anymore. He works full time on Vue, funded by a Patreon campaign. So I checked this last night, and he receives uh, $20,500 a month from commercial and individual sponsorship. And I think that shows how strongly the Vue community feels about the product. And as a result of that, Vue's independent from any big tech, tech company. Um, it brands itself as a progressive framework. What that means is uh, it's incrementally adoptable. You can start off using it really easily to control just one thing on your page. And then as your skills develop, as your appetite for using Vue develops, as your requirements get more complex, um, it scales with you. It's, it's really powerful, but it's not overwhelming. Finally, the last thing is really important. It's template-based. So rather than writing sort of a JavaScriptified version of HTML like JSX, you write um, valid HTML, um, and Vue will parse that, and it will turn it into a virtual DOM at runtime. Got another one of these scale slides. And here we're going to be talking about um, the sort of footprint or the size and the ambition of these frameworks or libraries. So on the left-hand side, we've got React. Um, it's a library rather than a framework. It does one thing, and it does it really, really well. Um, it helps you build UIs that react to user input. For other features, there's a massive ecosystem. Um, there's so many additional things which you can extend your Vue app with. Um, and that ecosystem's healthy, it's big, and that's really great. There's kind of a cost to that size, as there's so many options. People have very strong opinions. Um, you need to spend time finding what works for you, and there's sort of a cost to that decision making. Angular, on the other side of the spectrum, is a framework. So it tries to do everything. It will handle your routing for you, your form validation, all your UI stuff. Um, it's quite heavyweight. You need to buy into using it. You need to commit to using it. But it saves you from having to make design decisions, which can take time and be um, difficult if it's not your specialist area. Vue, similar to progressive decoupling, occupies this nice middle spot. Um, the Vue core is quite small. It's about the same size as jQuery. Um, it does everything React does with a few sort of extra syntactical sugar type stuff. It's got um, tools for managing animations, tools for managing transitions. But it, it's not too heavyweight. It kind of stops there. If you want to extend it, there's um, core plugins. So they're separate from the core code base, but they're maintained by the core team. And there's an ecosystem which is much smaller than React, but it also has less duplication. Um, so if you need to extend it, there's generally one thing that most people use, or one or two things. Um, so it's got a small footprint. You can extend it. And when you need to extend it, it's not overwhelming with choice. I'm going to talk about why I think it's really, really cool. The fundamental thing is that it's kind of, it's, it gives you a shift in the way you think about your front-end development. So um, rather than the DOM being the single source of truth, as it was um, in the jQuery days, Everything's now data-based. So if you have an element and you want to add a class to it, you have a JavaScript object that represents that element's classes. You bind that object to the element through a view directive, which we'll talk about in a minute. 
And then whenever anything adds to that object, whether it's um, a method in your own code, whether it's someone using the view developer tools, um, whether it's anything else, the DOM will automatically be updated in real time. So you tell Vue what data you want to track, and that could be strings, it could be objects of classes, it could be arrays. Whenever those things are modified in any way, it picks up on it and it updates the DOM. So there's no need to create events to watch for changes. Um, we don't have to bind our code to sort of long query string selectors or anything like that. Um, and it just works really, really nicely. As a bonus, um, a lot of people are using Vue as a replacement for jQuery. So there's two articles here, Smash Magazine and CSS Tricks. I'll tweet the link to my slides afterwards if you want to check them out. And Vue works similar to jQuery in that you can attach it to anything on the page. Um, it can use existing markup, which is really, really great for working with Twig templates. Um, and we've actually got an example here. So I won't spend too long on this because it's something that many of us will be familiar with. But in the jQuery way, we um, write a selector, we attach a click event, we do some class toggling, we do some attribute toggling. If I was to change that button to a different element, or if I was to change that toggle class, the whole thing would stop working. With Vue, we've got um, some new things to introduce. So we have Vue directives, which are kind of extensions to HTML that you put in your twig and which tell Vue what to do, basically. So that at click, that means attach a click event. The colon before aria pressed means bind the value of aria pressed to active um, or evaluate this JavaScript. These things would normally be um, in your JavaScript. You wouldn't have like the actual um, click event function in the code, but it's just an example. Later on, I'll show you a, a bigger example. Um, and then on our JavaScript, it's just four lines of code. We tell Vue that we're dealing with this element, and we tell it to track a piece of data called active, which is a Boolean, and it starts off false. When the click event happens, active will be set to the opposite of its current value, and as a result, this will update, so aria pressed will be toggled too. We've also got a class example here, where we've got a object, which is bound to the class attribute, and the class red will be shown if the value of active is true or false. So we're not using like a toggle class function, we're just dealing with standard JavaScript objects, standard Boolean stuff, um, which really helps you not get too confused. Another massive thing for me is, is easy going learning curve. So it feels like an extension of HTML um, rather than a, a replacement. Um, the documentation's really solid, the community's nice, the dev tools are great, it's quite an easy thing to get yourself into. As an example of the developer experience, I wanted to show um, how to do something in React and then how to do something with Vue. Um, this is how to do a two-way data binding. So what that means is when I type in this input, the value up here is updated. So our HTML is just an empty div called app. And then in here, we've got a React component. Um, we set up some state to track value. We've got a function that handles changes. And then we've got um, our sort of template in the JavaScript file, which gets rendered onto the page. So it's, it's quite, an amount, quite a lot, I think, of code. Um, I'm sure someone who's better than me at React will be able to write that in a, a nicer way. Um, but this is an example I adapted from a Flavio Copes tutorial, so hopefully it's OK. To do the same thing in Vue is that. So this is an example of, of, Vue, see, of Vue knowing that there's going to be a lot of people doing this a lot of the time, and it provides a little shortcut, which is vModel. So vModel means basically bind this value and then on change also update that value. So rather than having to specify those two things separately, we're doing it just with the vModel um, directive. So this would be our twig file. Um, we can see that the markup is in twig, so we don't have to like reconfigure our IDE to do syntax highlighting differently. Um, if we've got things processing those twig files, we can still process them. The markup stays where it belongs, really, which is in a, a Drupal template and language. On the JavaScript side of things, we attach view to the element, which is the ID in the HTML. And again, we tell it to track a piece of data called name. So that's all it takes. Um, this is a slightly more complex example. It's like a name badge generator. I'm typing in here. The name badge is updated. Um, we're going to show you some more view directives here. So up here, we've got something called vCloak. 
And what that does is um, that is removed once view has initiated itself. So in your CSS, if you put v cloak display none, that means this whole thing will be hidden until the JavaScript's run, and that stops the user from seeing the placeholders. We've got v if here, which we use to toggle. So if the name's empty, we get the shrug emoji, which comes from here, because we've got an exclamation mark in front of name. If name has a true value, then we show the capitalized name. What capitalized name is, is an example of a computed property in Vue. So computed properties are really, really cool. Um, they basically take an existing piece of data, which is name, and they transform it. And Vue is clever enough to work out what the dependencies of the computed property are. So it knows that if name changes, then capitalized name needs to change. Um, and it's clever enough to only update the bits of the DOM that need it. So it's not going to render the whole page again. This is an example of the Vue dev tools, which I love. They make debugging so much easier. Um, I've extended the example a little bit. There's like now a range slider. Um, you can say how excited you are, and then this gets bolder and exclamation marks. You can see the excitement values increasing up here. You can also see when someone clicks submit, this array, which is currently empty, is going to get a value pushed into it. So I'm doing this, um, I think, with the keyboard or the mouse but we can see that the DevTools is updated in real time, which is like really useful for when something's not working and you want to try and figure it out. Important thing to note is that in both those examples, there was no build process. We weren't having to run NPM watch or anything. Um, you, can, you can use Vue just by including it as a script tag. If you've got a massive application, you're probably not going to want to do that. You'll want to use Webpack or whatever, but you can start off just doing it like that. And that's what I meant earlier about it being really easy to dip your toes into it. So for me, Vue feels really complementary with Drupal. Um, they both have a focus on doing things in markup. With Drupal 8, we started doing a lot more of Twig. With Vue, we keep our directives alongside our markup, so there's less context shifting between files. And um, there's an argument there about separation of concerns, but for me, I'd rather spend less time switching between files and trying to remember what I'm doing. And um, perhaps that's a personal opinion. They both have a small core functionality, but lots of plugins. They're both sort of independent open source projects. Um, and with the case of Vue, it's easy to add to existing sites. So the project I'm going to be talking about in a moment, we built it as a standard Drupal site until we realized the Drupal Ajax stuff wasn't going to cut it, and we had to use Vue. So let's talk about that now. The site we were working on was a university website. So obviously, it's one of its core functions was to promote the programs, the courses, the degrees that the university offers. For especially their undergraduate degrees, they had a lot of what they called variants. So if I wanted to do um, a course in like airline management, I could do it full time, I could do it part time, I could do it with a foundation year, I could do it with an industrial placement year, I could start in September, I could start maybe in the calendar year in January. And all these variants have different content because one with a placement year will take longer to complete, it might cost a bit more. And until the redevelopment of their website, each of these course variants was its own node. So there was a lot of shared content between the nodes, but also a few differences. The university was hit with duplicate content penalties from an SEO point of view, and they also had a maintenance overhead. Their CMS users were having to spend a lot of time updating the same things in different places. There was even a bit of a, um, a concern about regulations, so the courses have content which has to be there by law, and it has to be update, updated, rather. Um, and they were concerned that having the different nodes would mean that they might not always have the right content in the right place. So we wanted to get all of this stuff on one single page. We wanted to have a single canonical URL. Um, we wanted to have all the Google juice on focus on that one page rather than distributed. We also wanted a much better user experience. Um, the prospective students were frustrated about switching between all these different pages, trying to work out what was different, which one they should be looking at. So we wanted a, a more app-like user experience. We wanted content to update automatically on the page, for changes to be highlighted, um, and for all of that to happen sort of instantaneously. So this is the, the Drupal side of the solution. Um, Nothing we did here was particularly complex, but we had a really good end result, and I think that is one of the things that encouraged me to do this talk. 
Um, we built something that feels advanced, but when you look at the code, it isn't actually that complex. And as a result, we've had very, very few like big issues with it, very few big bugs. On the Drupal side of things, we have a content type for courses with all the usual fields. Um, anything that's static that stays the same between variants is just a regular field on the content type. And then we have a paragraph field which contains all our variants. So each variant would be like starting at this time, doing it full time, starting this time, doing it part time, and so on. We expose the variant data to our view application through Drupal settings, which I'll talk about in a moment. And then we have a custom twig macro which prints these variant fields but with a sort of wrapping element which um, Vue uses to control their visibility. So all the data is actually on the page. Um, Drupal prints it there. All we're using Vue for, well, primarily what we're using Vue for is to control its visibility. We also use it to like, update the URL so people can share a query string parameter of the variants in. Uh, we use it to allow the user to copy the application code to their clipboard for when they apply on an external site, a few more things. But the main thing is showing and hiding these variants and presenting a user interface to, to toggle between them. So this is kind of a zoomed out view of what it looks like. Um, on the left hand side, we've got a larger view of the page. Um, and I've highlighted in pink some of the things that change. So this shows what modules are available, like what units of study. Um, it's also got some introductory text that can change. So that will all be updated. Lower down, there's lots more of those examples. And up here, and on the right-hand side, we've got an example of the user interface. So this is a sticky bar. Um, we have a study option here, which is the sort of full-time, part-time thing. We also have a start date. Um, both of those are select elements. If you update one, the list in the other will change, depending on what's available. But we did some user testing, and it turns out not everyone sort of thought to interact with those. So lower down, we've got these things which look like sort of links or buttons. And these do exactly the same. So if the user misses the options here in the select element, they can use these instead. And of course, if they change them down here, it also changes it up there. It keeps it all in sync. And that would have been really hard to do, I think, with a sort of DOM in control approach. But with the data in control approach, that's fine because we just write to the data object and then the view updates everything for us. So this is what it looks like in Drupal. You can see we've got a bunch of course variant paragraphs, and inside them there's, there's quite a lot of things. Um, start dates, sort of codes for the application systems, um, how long it takes, some more internal stuff. There's some entity references there to um, shared content, like information about the funding options available or application requirements. So let's talk about how we get that data out of our paragraphs and into Vue. So this is a sort of simplified example. We're going to build a little view app which toggles between two logos. Um, this wasn't taken from the university project. It was a project I was working on recently which had like sub-brands, and we wanted to sort of um, be able to change the logo through view based on a Drupal setting. So on the PHP side, we've got a HTML preprocess function, and we're setting our logo variant value to be B. There's A, there's B. Here we're setting it to B. We tell Drupal, we're going to be using some Drupal settings on this page, so we attach that library. And then we create a Drupal setting with our module name and our logo variant key, and we set it to the value of logo variant, so it's going to be B. Then, in our view, um, we create the component or app, tie it to the ID of app, it could be anything. In our data object, we have got current source, and we're reading this from Drupal settings, which will already be on the page because we attach the library. So current source is going to be Drupal settings, module name, logo variant, which we'll evaluate to be. Then we've got an object of our two different logos, so two images um, hosted on Cloudinary, A and B. Down here, um, we've got another computed value called logo source. And what logo source is going to do is it's going to return from the array the key which matches this current source. So this current source, Drupal setting, will be B. It will pick this out of the object. And then in our markup, we've put a colon in front of the source attribute, which means we want to bind this to a view um, piece of data. And we're binding it to logo source, which we had on the, um, the previous slide. 
So let's talk about how we use this. Um, we had some things which were like simple strings. So those, um, we just output a view um, placeholder with the double curly brackets, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then when that changes in the view data, it gets updated automatically. We had some more complex stuff. We had things which weren't just the simple string, but were like whole collections and markup. Um, those things like the entity references I spoke about earlier, which put it in like almost a mini page. For those, we made a custom twig function and a twig macro. And what that does is it outputs the field as per normal in Drupal, but it wraps a div around it, which has some of these view directives. And we'll look at that in a second. So view hides, shows and hides those elements. Um, View's got two ways of doing that. You can use um, vif, which will actually add and remove things from the DOM. And it has vshow, which will display none or display what it was initially. We used vshow. Um, mainly for performance reasons. If you've got a lot of things changed on the page, um, VF will be updating and removing the DOM in quite a lot of places. Whereas if you use VShow, it's just toggling visibility, which is a much cheaper way of doing it from a performance point of view. What's interesting is we didn't actually use any APIs for this. Um, when the work first came in, we were like, oh cool, we can use JSON API, that would be great. But in reality, we didn't, kind of didn't really need to because um, we're just toggling the visibility. And the advantage of that is there's no network request being made. So if I'm using this on my phone and I go through a tunnel, like say I'm on a train or something, it's still gonna work because we're not querying an API. Um, for more complex examples or things with external data, we'd probably have to use an API, but in this case, we didn't need to, which was nice. So let's get into the, the twig side of it. Um, what we've got here is two divs, We've got a data attribute here, which we just use um, to flash with CSS if it's updated. And then we've got a condition. For this one, we're gonna be showing this if um, the user said they want to override this bit of content at a variant level. The more interesting bit is what we've got here. So Rutherford is our theme. Um, it's like an atomic design theme with Pattern Lab, so we named it after Rutherford, who was an atomic scientist in Manchester. Um, so we're loading our theme, we're getting its twig macros, and we've got a twig macro called print variant. We give it the field name, we give it a list of variants, which we want to print. So this is going to print one, two, three, four, as many as variants as there are for that field. Um, and we give it a field type, which in this case is a long text one. This is our twig macro. So the main thing for us to focus on is the middle. What this does is we render our Drupal field here. Um, so we've got a set block, we put the field markup in it, we end the set block, and that's gonna get printed out here. To wrap it, we've got a div. We've got a vcloak attribute, so the user won't see like five different variants and then suddenly one as the JavaScript runs. We've got some data attributes which we use for the styling, as I mentioned earlier. And then down here, we have got a vshow directive. And what this is saying to view is only show this div and its contents if the current variant, which comes from the view data object, matches the variant ID, which Twig is gonna print a integer to. We also have a check to see what the current funding nationality is. So some things like the course fees are gonna vary if you're applying from within the EU or domestically um, compared to if you're applying from overseas. So that added a little extra layer of complexity. But in most cases, it was just um, updating our if statements. So um, Twig will run through this. It will print all our different variants. View will control what's shown and what's not. The next thing to do was to build the UI for the variant selector. So this is the thing we saw earlier where you can use the select element. You can use the, the links or buttons. And I've pulled up dev tools here. So it's really small, but in this highlighted area, as the user interacts with these things, we can see that these integers are being updated in real time. Um, so whenever one of these is selected, we know the user is gonna need to see some new content. So we run through um, all of the possible variants. We look at all the start dates all the study options, so they're the full-time, part-time stuff. 
we reduce those two arrays to their unique values, and then we find start dates that match that study option, and we update the list. So we used quite a lot of um, Lodash here. We used the Lodash filter function quite a lot, the, the one that extracts unique values. We could probably have done that with sort of ES6 stuff, but I, in my opinion, it would have made it harder for other people to work on, um, harder for the product to be supported, and it would have like, increased the, the um, barrier to entry to work on it. Something that's cool to note is that these are not actually um, buttons, they're not anchors, they're styled radio buttons. And the reason we did that is because these things can only ever have one value. They can only ever be like this one toggled or this one toggled for the dates. And that's something that radio elements or rather inputs with a radio type give you out of the box with native HTML. So we didn't need to write any JavaScript functionality to make that work, it just worked. And that's kind of a trend I see a lot in looking at other people's view code. The way it feels like an extension of HTML means that you're more likely to use sort of built-in HTML things. So there are some caveats with progressive decoupling, just like any other type of decoupling. Let's run through those. We've got about eight minutes, plus we need to do some questions as well. So accessibility is a big thing. Um, browsers have been around for a long time. They're really good at letting the user know when there's been a page change. JavaScript and updating the DOM dynamically is less good at doing those things. But we've got a few ways around that. First thing is to do, um, you can consider using ARIA live regions. So Drupal has a helper function for this. If you search for drupal.announce, um, it basically just reads out a string. So you can announce that something's changed. For people that might have trouble observing which bits are different, you might consider using an animation um, or like a focus ring type thing to highlight what's being changed. If you're concerned about making the page too flashy for people that might prefer less motion, there's the prefers reduced motion media query, so you could turn that off. Um, and you should also consider setting focus to things that have changed if there is one part of the page which is changing. It's more difficult when there's multiple things changing. Um, if you want to read more about this, it's like a massive subject. Um, it's quite easy to get wrong, but there's also a lot of basics which cover most people's mistakes. And the accessibility project A11Y, it's a new um, accessibility project A11Y project.com has a checklist and a resources page, and I'll tweet those links later on. The other thing to watch out for is SEO. So um, search engines, particularly Google, have got a lot better over the years with indexing dynamic content. The way Google does it at the moment, to the best of my knowledge, is with two waves. So it will initially index your site without JavaScript enabled. It will look at your sort of plain HTML com content. And then later on, it will do a second wave. And that's when it will run JavaScript. So it's best to serve your sort of default state as HTML. So in our case, the paragraph, which is at the top of that multi-value field, paragraphs field, that's always shown. Um, so when Google runs through the page the first time, that's what will get indexed. When it runs through the second time, it will realize there's a bit more interactivity going on, and it will it'll handle that. If you want to see how your site looks from Google's point of view, um, use their fetch as Google tool. Finally, um, we've got some tips and tricks for using Drupal and Vue. So these are things that I, I learned the hard way. The key thing with Twig is that they have the same delimiters. So if you print a view variable and if you print a twig variable, they're both wrapped in those double curly brackets. So we need to get around that, otherwise you spend ages refreshing your page wondering why there's nothing on it. One way to do that is with twig's verbatim filter. So what verbatim in a single curly bracket and a um, percentage sign means is ignore everything until I end this verbatim tag. Um, yeah, it's not a filter, is it? Um, but that's really good, because then Twig won't worry about those double curly brackets, and they'll get passed to the browser, which means Vue will be able to deal with them. A second way around that is to not use the double curly brackets at all. So if you've got quite a simple situation where we have this span um, and we want to put some text in it, we can use the vText directive. So what that means is update the inner text of this HTML element to the value of leader type in this case. If you want to get really creative, you can also change the view delimiters. 
Um, you can set something on the window object which does that, or you can do it per app. So you could have it as like da double dashes or triple underscores or whatever, but then that's going to make it harder for people that are new to your project that have to figure out what the, what the like, special delimiters are. So these, those two are my favorite ways of doing it. Next tip is switching between the minified version of Vue, which is great for production, but doesn't have the dev tools. The way we do that is we have a Vue Drupal library for the minified version. Then we have a library alter hook. We check to see whether JavaScript preprocessing is turned on at a Drupal level. Um, and if it isn't, then we switch out the minified version for the unminified version, which gives us access to dev tools um, and sort of much nicer error reporting. Final tip, um, Vue tries to be helpful and it strips out HTML comments from Vue templates. If your Vue template is also your Twig template, that means it's gonna get rid of your nice Drupal theme debugging comments which tell you what templates are being used. To fix that, just add this comments true um, line to your, to your Vue files and then it will leave the Drupal template um, comments as they are. So, um, in conclusion, I love working with Vue. I think it's really simple, but it's also powerful. And I think it's a really good fit with Drupal, particularly because of how you can use it with existing markup and in Twig files. And that's it. Thank you very much. So we have three and a half minutes for questions. So maybe we could do one or two, and then I'll be around at lunch if anyone wants to talk about any of this. Does anyone have a question? Hey. Yeah, definitely. So the question was, um, we're using Vue on this project. Do we still use jQuery? Do we use Drupal behaviors? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, maybe if I was a purist, if my team was a purist, we wouldn't be doing that. But the reality is we've got um, plugins on the page, like our tabs plugin. Um, we need to control that, and that's done through jQuery events. So we use jQuery there. Um, I also ran into a problem where our lazy loading script, lazy sizes, um, wasn't detecting some of Vue's changes, so we used a little bit of quite dirty jQuery there to fix that. Um, we use Drupal behaviors for the content on the page which isn't handled by Vue. Um, we also call attach behaviors every time um, Vue updates certain parts of the pages so that our Drupal behaviors that handle things like the tabs run. Um, so yeah, the, the two can coexist. Um, we haven't really had any problems with integration there, and there haven't been problems with conflict. So it's kind of a mixed code base at the moment, but we're, we're using what feels like the right tool for the right job. If there's a lot of really heavy DOM stuff um, that can't be done with this database approach, then we use jQuery, because that's kind of what it's made for, and it's, it's still good at that. You're welcome. Um, anyone else? Okay, at the back in red. Yeah, I can use the boxes, but I'm really bad at throwing. Yeah, can you run it back? I don't want to ruin like my talk by breaking someone's glasses or something. Hey. Hi. Uh, I'm wondering what would be your suggestion in terms of strategy for progressive decoupling. For example, my team and uh, I are playing with commerce site, so shop. Uh, we have a couple of things decoupled, not using Vue, we are considering it. But um, I don't know, first co uh, things come to my mind is, I don't know, product variation switching, you know, not to use Ajax, but maybe switch to Vue. So back to my question, is you know what about strategy? You know how how to approach progressive decoupling, for example, with commerce sites. What is your experience and suggestion? Um, it's a good question. Something I didn't actually mention was this was my first time using Vue with Drupal. Um, I've used it for building SPAs. I've used it for hobbyist stuff, but this is the first time I've done it with Drupal. So I'm not by any means an expert. Um, I think you're right in pointing out that the product variation has similarities with the course variations. Um, so I can imagine that a similar approach to what we did here would work. 
Um, in terms of strategy, perhaps consider building like a, an MVP, so a sort of prototype. Um, get one product which has a few variations and then maybe mock up quite a sort of rough and ready, simple looking app. Um, like I said, it's the, the view learning curve is gentle. There's a lot of really good learning resources. You could even just build it in a code pen or something. Um, maybe I'm not a good strategist, but I think maybe start with a, a sort of simple reduced case like that, and then if you feel like it's great, if you really like it, you can look at doing it in Drupal. Um, it's probably not the best possible answer, but um, I guess the advice is just to try it. Thanks. Um, yeah, if, should we do one more? We are over, so feel free to go. But I think Hi. someone's waiting. Hi. I have a question about uh, search and filtering for courses. Uh, on university pages, on course catalogs, one of important features is uh, searching. Uh, question is, do you use search and filtering using Drupal filters or view functions? Okay, yeah, good question. Um, so this piece of work was covering the course pages themselves. We had some other work which was the course search functionality. Um, we're not actually using Vue for that yet. We, we could do. Um, I know some of the universities have like really nice sort of real-time searches. Um, if you're interested in that, I think Algolia are really, really good at sort of JavaScript-based search, and they interact with Vue well. I know that their team uses it. But in our case, um, the core search is, is sort of search API with Solar, um, which runs off the, the Drupal data. Um, it, it's got... It's got facets, but they're handled by Drupal um, behaviors rather than view. But there's an area there to potentially look at improving in the future. Great, thank you very much. <laughs> Don't forget to come to contribution and to leave your session feedback. Thanks a lot, guys.